Hello and welcome to another of our LVS webinars. Uh, today we're going to talk about radiographic assessment of the heart. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very short introduction. My name is Ian Jones and I'm a radiologist. I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 2004 and I did my RCVS certificate in 2009. I went on to complete the imaging residency at the Royal Veterinary College uh, between 2013 and 2016. And I finally got my European diploma in 2018. If you would like to get in touch, then you can find me at London Veterinary Specialists, which is a multidisciplinary referral veterinary hospital in the very heart of London. If I can assist you at all with any questions you have regarding imaging, um, if you have some radiographs you'd like me to take a look at, or if you'd like to discuss a case because uh, you are just considering what imaging modality might be most appropriate for a particular patient, then please get in touch. Um, you can give me a call at the clinic or drop me a line via email. Like the previous webinar that we produced, uh, this one is also based on a chapter taken from uh, this book by Donald Thrall. Um, for me, it's the Bible of small animal veterinary diagnostic imaging. And uh, more than any other, this book has taught me most about veterinary radiology. I became very familiar with it indeed during my residency. And today we're going to take another look at uh, one of the chapters, um, it's chapter 33, which was actually written by Dr. Robert Barr. So when we are evaluating thoracic radiographs and we're looking specifically at the heart, there's usually a couple of questions that we're trying to answer. The first question is usually, do we think the heart is normal? And uh, more often than not, we're trying to decide whether the heart is too big. If we decide that the heart is abnormal, if there's cardi cardiomegaly present, then we need to try and decide whether there is left-sided or right-sided enlargement. And if we have a patient that has cardiomegaly, that has either right or left-sided enlargement, so we're pretty confident that this patient has heart disease, then we need to try and decide whether or not there's any evidence of heart failure. So this presentation is going to try and help you develop a, su a suitable clinical paradigm for trying to answer all those three questions so that when you're looking at a thoracic radiograph, you can be confident that a patient either does or doesn't have heart disease, what sort of heart disease they might have, and whether or not it's likely that that patient might be in heart failure. So before we can decide whether a heart is abnormal, uh, whether a heart is too big, we need to think about the sorts of things that can cause incidental, normal, or anatomic variation. And there's a couple of things we need to be aware of. So there's certainly some breed variation in terms of the way that the cardiac silhouette can appear. Uh, the positioning of the patient can affect how the heart looks. So a DV versus a VD, a right versus a left lateral, that can affect the way that the cardiac silhouette appears on the thoracic radiograph. And we need to decide whether or not we need to think about using an objective means of measuring cardiac size. And invariably, that'll be the vertebral heart score. So let's think about how the breed of the patient can affect how the heart looks. Now, when we talk about breed variation, we're talking about uh, dogs specifically. So feline hearts um, look pretty similar, uh, regardless of the type of cat that's being examined. Uh, dogs, however, much more variation. So uh, you've got very small barrel-chested dogs, um, so brachycephalic breeds um, like pugs, bulldogs. They tend to have um, a very uh, fat, broad-looking cardiac silhouette, whereas uh, deep-chested dogs um, like uh, Dobermans, um, wolfhounds, Afghans, they tend to have a longer, much more elongated heart. So here we've got a uh, lateral and a ventrodorsal radiograph uh, of a pug, and hopefully uh, you can appreciate that the cardiac silhouette um, looks kind of chunky and round, and there's quite a lot of sternal contact. And in the VD view, um, also that the heart, it, it's quite wide, it's, it's taking up 
a large proportion um, of the thoracic cavity. But this is a normal pug. This is a pug that doesn't have any heart disease to speak of. Now, if we compare that to these thoracic radiographs, so again, we have a lateral and a ventrodorsal thoracic radiograph, this time taken from a wolfhound. Uh, and here we can see that the heart looks much more elongated. Um, it, it looks quite tall and thin in the lateral view and also in the VD view. Um, it's got this, this elongated appearance. It doesn't look anywhere near um, as a squat, um, as wide or as round um, as the cardiac silhouette that we looked at in the pug just a moment ago. So a normal heart will look different depending on the breed of the dog. And it's very important to remember that when we're evaluating thoracic radiographs. So a normal radiograph of a thorax, a normal cardiac silhouette in a pug is gonna look slightly different to a normal uh, heart in a Labrador versus a normal heart in a Wolfhound. So if we considered the breed of the dog in terms of whether or not we think that the appearance of the heart is normal, we then need to just consider whether we're looking at a dorsoventral, a ventrodorsal, a right or a left lateral view, because the, it does subtly change the way that the cardiac silhouette appears. So in the dorsoventral view, uh, the heart has a tendency to sit in a more cranial position to the left, and in a ventrodorsal view, uh, because uh, the heart is effectively further away from the cassette, the heart tends to look bigger. So you'll get magnification of the heart in a ventrodorsal view. So if we take a look at a, a dorsoventral and a ventrodorsal view uh, of the same patient, so the dorsoventral view is on the left and the ventrodorsal view is on the right. Uh, hopefully, you guys can appreciate that in the dorsoventral view, the heart just looks like it's sitting a little bit more to the left within the thoracic cavity, and just looks like it's maybe sitting a little bit more cranial in the thoracic cavity relative to the VD view, which is on the right. So in the VD view, uh, the heart looks bigger than it does in the DV view, and this is because it's magnified and is sitting in a much more central position. So uh, whereas in the DV, it sort of looks like it's just drifting over to the left. In the VD, it's very central uh, and it's bigger. So be aware of those changes and differences between a DV and a VD thoracic radiograph in terms of how it affects the location and appearance of the cardiac silhouette. If we compare right versus left lateral views of the thorax, not too many changes. The only thing worth mentioning is in the left lateral view, the cardiac apex can appear slightly elevated. So if we compare a uh, right versus a left lateral view, uh, this is the same dog, it's a normal dog. In the left lateral view, which is uh, on the right here, uh, we can see um, that the cardiac silhouette is just ever elevated ever so slightly uh, from the sternum. You compare that to the right lateral view, the apex is sat just adjacent um, to the sternum. Now that's important because if a patient has cardiac disease and, and more specifically right-sided disease, um, that can increase the degree of sternal contact and can sometimes result in elevation of the cardiac silhouette in the right lateral view. So it's important to remember that if you see slight elevation of the cardiac silhouette in the left lateral view, that's just a normal positional variant. If you see elevation of the uh, apex of the heart in the right lateral view, um, then that's abnormal. And uh, in a patient where you're suspicious that there could be underlying cardiac disease, it might be a change related to right-sided disease, so enlargement of the right side of the heart. When it comes to deciding whether the heart is too big, having considered all of the breed and positional variants that there might be, the best way is to have looked at many, many thoracic radiographs and to subjectively be able to evaluate 
the size, the shape, the location, the opacity of the cardiac silhouette and make a confident judgment as to whether or not that heart looks normal. Now, unfortunately, many of us haven't looked at enough thoracic radiographs to make that decision and to be confident about it. And on those occasions where we're not sure whether this heart is too big, the thing to do is to, rather than make a subjective assessment, to be objective about it. And the way to objectively decide whether a heart is too big is to use the vertebral heart score. Now, the way that you measure the vertebral heart score is that uh, you take a measurement um, from the uh, hilus uh, to the apex, and you take a measurement perpendicular to that at the level of the ventral border of the caudal vena cava, and you see how these measurements compare to the number of thoracic vertebrae. Um, so uh, you can essentially take the uh, length and you compare that to the thoracic vertebra, you take the width and you compare that to the thoracic vertebra, and then you add them up. And in a normal dog, the vertebral heart score should be no more than about 10 and a half, and in a normal cat should be no more than about seven and a half. Now, uh, this can vary widely between breeds and uh, when you're attempting a vertebral heart score in uh, a brachycephalic, like a bulldog or um, a French bulldog or a Boston Terrier, you need to be aware that a lot of those dogs are going to have thoracic vertebral malformations, and that really is going to affect the vertebral heart score. So it certainly isn't um, an absolute, and uh, you need to be uh, careful about recognizing the things that might affect the vertebral heart score, particularly in dogs that have abnormal thoracic vertebrae. So if you're struggling to decide whether a heart is too big subjectively, then by all means, um, get the ruler out and uh, measure uh, the vertebral heart score, and that can help. Um, but it isn't an, an absolute. Um, and just be aware that uh, just as the breed, the position, et cetera, can affect the subjective assessment of the size of the heart. Um, the, the vertebral heart score that isn't without its variations and without its problems. Um, so it's, it's not an absolute and you shouldn't rely on it completely. Hopefully, if you guys are presented with thoracic radiographs that look like this, um, you're not going to be in any doubt that this heart is, is massively enlarged. So we've got a left lateral radiograph and a dorsal ra dorsal ventral radiograph um, of a dog, and the heart is, is hugely enlarged. It's occupying uh, the vast majority of the thoracic cavity in both the lateral and the dorsal ventral views. Now, as well as being massively enlarged, um, it has quite a, a globoid shape. Um, so it looks quite round um, in both the lateral and the dorsoventral view. Now, this dog has a large volume pericardial effusion, and that's why it's got marked generalized cardiomegaly. That's why this heart is massively enlarged and round. If you guys had any doubt as to this patient having a pericardial effusion, um, which turned out to be this patient's problem, then an easy way to find out, find out would be to just pop the probe on the chest and look for that fluid uh, within the pericardium. Now, uh, not all patients have large globoid hearts, um, and often uh, the enlargement is confined to uh, either a single or several chambers, uh, major vessels, and occasionally we can look at the pulmonary vasculature as well to try and help us decide which part of the heart is affected, which part of the heart is enlarged. Here, this patient has marked generalized enlargement, but we need to be able to hazard a guess as to whether more specific enlargement is either left-sided or right-sided. And like I said, we can do this by systematically evaluating the cardiac chambers uh, the major vessels and the pulmonary vasculature. So first of all, we'll take a look at the cardiac chambers and uh, the heart's made up of the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right atrium and the right ventricle. So 
if we're trying to decide whether a patient has left-sided or right-sided enlargement, then we should systematically try and evaluate all of those chambers and decide whether they're too big. Now, uh, one of the best ways of doing this is to use the clock face analogy in either a dorsoventral or a ventrodorsal radiograph. And that can tell us a lot about which parts of the heart might be enlarged and might be abnormal. And that can really help us when we're trying to decide what the primary cardiac disease is in this patient that's presenting to us. So if you think about a clock face and you think about where the heart is on a dorsoventral or a ventrodorsal radiograph, uh, then if this is 12 o'clock here, uh, this is uh, six o'clock, then we've got three o'clock and nine o'clock. And if we look at where the various chambers are likely to be, the right atrium would be between nine o'clock and 11 o'clock. The aortic arch would be between 11 o'clock and one o'clock. The main pulmonary artery between one o'clock and two o'clock. And then the left oracle between two o'clock and three o'clock. Now, again, this clock face analogy isn't entirely foolproof, but it can be super helpful when we're trying to decide this patient has an abnormal heart. It, it looks an abnormal shape. and It's too big. Which part of the heart do I think is most likely to be affected? Do I think this patient has right sided disease or left sided disease? Using this clock face analogy when we're evaluating DV and VD radiographs can be super useful. Um, so. Uh, I'd advise you to try and remember the times that we've just talked about when evaluating these hearts. More specifically, the left atrium, which is something that we are going to want to evaluate quite commonly, given all of the dogs out there that have mitral valve disease. In a lateral view, a dog with a big left atrium will have a cardiac silhouette with a very steep caudal margin. And not only will the caudal margin of the cardiac silhouette be very steep, the big heart and the big left atrium will also be deviating the trachea dorsally. And that big left atrium, as well as pushing the trachea up, it's going to be squashing the adjacent bronchi. So in a lateral radiograph, if you see a heart that looks big, if you see the caudal margin of the cardiac silhouette looks a little bit too steep, the trachea looks a little bit too dorsal, and if the bronchi look um, flattened and displaced, then chances are that patient has a large left atrium. In the dorsoventral radiograph, uh, the left atrium uh, is gonna, going to push the uh, main stem bronchi apart. So there's going to be divergence of the bronchi, and quite often people will refer to that as a, a cowboy sign, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And very occasionally, um, you can see what looks like uh, a, the double wall of the left atrium. Um, so the left atrium uh, is so big, uh, it's superimposed on the remainder of the cardiac silhouette, creating a, a double wall type appearance because of the change in density and opacity. So these are lateral and dorsoventral radiographs of a dog with um, a markedly enlarged left atrium. So if we just take a step back and look at both of these radiographs, uh, we can see that this, this heart is too big. We shouldn't have to uh, measure the vertebral heart score in this patient. This heart in the lateral view is, is taking up almost all of the thoracic cavity and equally um, it's occupying uh, a huge proportion of the thoracic cavity in the DV view. Um, if we look at the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette, we can see that it, it looks pretty steep. And we've got these white arrows here to help us make out the border of the cardiac silhouette. The trachea um, is displaced dorsally. And um, it's difficult to see the main stem bronchi here. So it's quite difficult to comment on whether or not those bronchi are being compressed. But certainly we've got a huge big heart, we've got marked steepening of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette, and we've got dorsal displacement of the trachea. In the dorsoventral view, uh, the left atrium sits in, in this location, and it sits just between the main stem bronchi. So we have the trachea here, and we have uh, the right and the left main stem bronchus just here. And 
Uh, what happens is the left atrium, as it gets bigger, it, it pushes the main stem bronchi apart. And if we consider that the trachea to be the back of a cowboy who's sat on a large horse, the large horse being the enlarged left atrium, and the main stem bronchi being the cowboy's legs. The fact that the horse is so big, that the left atrium is so big, it's making the cowboy quite bow-legged sitting on this big horse. And that's why the divergence of the main stem bronchi is sometimes referred to as a cowboy sign. I think here there is um, an increase in the angle of bronchial divergence. And there's also this, this double wall sign. And we've got the black arrows here to help us out. So uh, this margin here uh, is the uh, border of the enlarged left atrium. It's superimposed on the rest of the heart uh, because it's way too big. So radiographs like this, you're going to come across very commonly in practice. Lots of dogs that have mitral valve disease are going to have enlarged left atria, and this is how they're going to appear on thoracic radiographs. It's pretty tricky to pick up left ventricular enlargement using radiographs, but if it's there, then it is going to cause dorsal deviation of trachea. Uh, occasionally, um, you're going to see a blunted cardiac apex in a DV view, and you're going to see slight rounding of the left side of the cardiac silhouette, again in a DV view. Uh, like I say, uh, it's, it's pretty tricky using thoracic radiographs to pick up left ventricular enlargement, but if it's there, those are the things to watch out for. So deviated trachea, blunting of the cardiac apex, and uh, rounding of the left side of the heart on a DV or a VD view. Uh, enlargement of the right atrium, uh, easier to see, on thoracic radiographs. In a lateral view, you're going to see bulging of the cardiac silhouette uh, cranially, and on a DV or a VD view, you're going to see um, a bulge in the 9 to 11 o'clock position using our clock face analogy. So let's take a look at some radiographs of a patient that has a very large right atrium. So here we've got a left lateral view and a DV view. Right, now this dog actually has a tricuspid dysplasia. Um, in the lateral view, the heart looks absolutely huge, um, looks uh, quite globoid in the lateral view, so not unlike the previous patient that had pericardial effusion, but in the DV view, uh, we can see, and we've got this very specific bulge between nine and 11 o'clock. Now the cranial bulge we were referring to um, is this bulge here. Um, so this is this is the right atrium. It's it's huge, it's bulging, um, and it's causing increased convexity of the cranial border of the cardiac silhouette in that left lateral view. So just to check our clock face analogy, and just to convince ourselves ourselves that this does check out, uh, this is our dog with tricuspid dysplasia, and this is the dorsoventral view, and this is our diagram for our clock analogy, and this is our right atrium here, and it certainly looks bulgy, and this is where we expect our right atrial bulge to be, so between 9 and 11 o'clock, and hopefully you can appreciate that, that that checks out pretty well. So for right ventricular enlargement in the lateral views, we'd expect to see increased sternal contact of the cardiac silhouette um, and also uh, a raised cardiac apex. Now this is in the right lateral rather than the left lateral view, like we said earlier, and characteristically in a patient that has right ventricular enlargement in the DV view, the heart is going to look like a reverse D. So let's take a look at a radiograph of a patient that has right-sided enlargement and has a big right ventricle. So we have right lateral and dorsoventral views of a dog with pulmonic stenosis. So uh, in the right lateral view, we can see that the sternal contact looks increased ever so slightly, and specifically the cardiac apex is raised above the sternum. In the dorsoventral view, uh, 
uh, we can see that this heart does have the characteristic reverse D. Um, so this is this is our reverse D just here. And not only that, because this dog has a pulmonic stenosis, it has an enlarged pulmonary artery, which is sat just here. So in the one to two o'clock position. So this dog, because of its pulmonic stenosis, has a big right ventricle, as evidenced by increased sternal contact and elevation of the cardiac silhouette from the sternum, by a reverse D appearance of the cardiac silhouette in the DV view. It also has a very striking bulge at the one to two o'clock position compatible with an enlarged pulmonary artery. Having looked at the cardiac chambers to try and decide whether a patient is more likely to have right versus left-sided cardiac disease, the next thing is to look at the major vessels. So to have a look at the caudal vena cava, the aorta, and the pulmonary artery. So if we start with the caudal vena cava in, in a lateral view, um, it should roughly be less than the length of T5 and less than 1. times the thickness of the aorta. And anything that increases central venous pressure is likely to result in an increase in size of the caudal vena cava. And this is it's quite a non-specific change. So it really could be anything that increases that uh, venous pressure. So uh, right-sided cardiac disease will do it. Uh, that could be secondary to pericardial effusion, say. Uh, pulmonary hypertension might do it. Thromboembolic disease might do it. Um, patients with parasitic disease, like uh, dogs with heartworm in the US, they might have big caudal vena cavas. Uh, if you have any sort of infiltrative vascular neoplastic lesion, that might do it. So it, it's a pretty non-specific finding, um, but worth uh, evaluating the caudal vena cava in these patients that you are suspicious of having heart disease, um, because uh, it can increase your index of suspicion, particularly in dogs where you, you think there could be a right-sided cardiac problem. Uh, for the aorta, um, if it's big, then in the lateral, um, you're going to see uh, a bulge uh, at the cranial aspect of the cardiac silhouette. And in the DV view, the mediastinum is going to appear wide. And using our clock face analogy again, there should be a bulge between 11 and 1 o'clock. For the pulmonary artery, um, we've already seen a patient um, with pulmonic stenosis that has um, a pulmonic bulge. Um, as well as that bulge, which is usually between one and two o'clock, you'll also see a wide mediastinum. So here's another example of a patient with a big pulmonary artery, and uh, we can see this bulge between one and two o'clock, which is exactly where we'd expect the pulmonary artery to be using our clock face analogy. And let's just double check it. Does it check out? clock face analogy, we'd expect to see a bulge between one and two o'clock. So just here, and just as we'd expect, between one and two o'clock, there is this bulge, which is absolutely compatible with an enlarged pulmonary artery. So having evaluated all of the major vessels, so the caudal vena cava, the aorta, and the pulmonary artery, um, it's always worth looking at the pulmonary vessels. So uh, we've covered this in a previous webinar. We were talking about lung patterns, but it's worth revisiting here. So uh, lung patterns and uh, cardiac disease tend uh, to go together. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is and how we tell whether a patient is in heart failure a little bit further down the line. But the thing to take away is whether you're evaluating the lungs or the heart, you should look at the pulmonary vessels because they can tell you quite a bit about what might or might not be going on. Just as we mentioned in the previous webinar, veins are ventral and veins are central. So in a lateral thoracic radiograph, veins are ventral, and in a DV or a VD radiograph, veins are central. And in order to decide whether they're too big, you need to compare them to the size of an adjacent rib. So usually in a lateral radiograph, you're comparing them to the size of the fourth rib. In a DV radiograph, you're comparing them to the size of the ninth rib. So this is a lateral radiograph, and we've centered on the uh, cranial lobar artery and vein. Um, so here we've got the right cranial lobar bronchus, 
And just as we said, veins are ventral, veins are central, veins are ventral in lateral radiographs. So we've got artery here, we've got bronchus, and we've got vein. So veins are ventral, we know this is the pulmonary vein, we know this is the pulmonary artery. And in a DV or a VD radiograph, veins are central. So let's look for the lobar bronchus, we've got trachea, we've got the main stem bronchus, and then this is the right caudal lobar bronchus just here. Veins are central, so that must mean this is the vein. So artery, bronchus, vein. Um, so uh, using um, that rhyme, you should be able to confidently identify the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein in both lateral and DVVD radiographs. And having identified the arteries and the veins, there's only really a couple of possibilities in terms of the uh, patterns that you might recognize. So either the veins are big relative to the arteries, or the arteries are big relative to the veins, or they're both big, or they're both small. Now, most of the time, particularly in patients that you're evaluating because you're suspicious of cardiac disease, they're gonna have big veins. So patients with mitral valve disease are gonna have big veins. Patients with myocardial disease, um, like DCM or HCM, are gonna have big veins. Uh, patients that have the more common sorts of congenital cardiac abnormalities like PDAs and, and VSDs, they're likely to have big veins as well. And if a patient has mitral valve disease and it's starting to get more severe and they're decompensating and starting to go into failure, um, then those patients will also have big veins. Patients that have just big arteries, you don't see it um, anywhere near as often. And um, the reasons for big arteries are not quite um, as, as various. So Again, patients with parasitic disease can have really big arteries. So patients with heartworm in the US, I think occasionally patients with lungworm as well can have big arteries. Uh, patients that have uh, thromboembolic disease, so um, pulmonary thromboembolism, they'll have big arteries. Uh, and again, um, patients that have congenital uh, cardiac abnormalities like PDAs, VSDs, uh, specifically left to right shunts, um, they're gonna have big arteries as well. Those patients um, that have big arteries and veins, if you see that, then you're going to be quite suspicious that that patient has uh, some sort of congenital cardiac abnormality like a PDA or a VSD. Um, you don't see them uh, too often, but if the arteries and the veins look big, then certainly uh, think about whether or not this patient might have some sort of um, shunting abnormality where the blood is being pushed from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. If the veins and the arteries look too small, then again, there aren't too many possibilities. Uh, you can get patients that have right to left shunts. It's really not very common. And um, you can get it in patients that have, say, a congenital defect called tetralogy of fallow, um, or patients that are really profoundly hypovolemic. Um, we're not really gonna see this very often, but if you do think that the arteries look really small and a patient isn't hypovolemic, then it's, it's possible that that patient might have an underlying congenital cardiac abnormality where the blood is being shunted from the right to the left side of the heart rather than from the left to the right, which is what usually happens. And tetralogy would be the one that should spring to mind. So um, having evaluated the heart grossly, decided that it's too big, having looked at all of the cardiac chambers and the major vessels and the pulmonary vasculature, we've decided that this patient definitely has heart disease. So now we need to decide whether or not the patient is in heart failure. And before we talk very briefly about the sorts of radiographic changes we'd expect to see in heart failure, it's, it's worth just spending a moment to think about the pathophysiology. So this patient we know has an underlying cardiac problem. And because of that, its cardiac output is reduced. Because its cardiac output is reduced, um, its glomerular filtration rate is reduced, and REN is released from the just glomerular apparatus of the kidneys. Uh, the renin then converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, and then um, angiotensin converting enzyme converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Uh, angiotensin 2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor, so it promotes sodium and water retention, and it also stimulates the release of aldosterone from the adrenal glands. And the aldosterone acts on the kidney, again, to promote sodium uh, conservation. 
and you get release of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone from the pituitary gland, uh, again, to uh, promote sodium retention. And because of that, you get a whole bunch of fluid retention and then you get heart failure. And the heart failure means that you get ongoing reduced cardiac output and the cycle just continues. So let's think about what would happen if a patient had left-sided heart failure. So left-sided heart failure is, is essentially due to increased pulmonary venous pressure. And uh, because of that, the pulmonary veins are going to be big and we're going to get pulmonary edema. Now, the distribution of the edema, which typically is going to manifest as either an interstitial or an alveolar pattern, um, is slightly different in the dog versus the cat. So in a dog, the pulmonary edema is going to be perihilar and is going to be in the dorsocaudal thorax. In the cat, the edema tends to be much more patchy. Um, so it can really be anywhere um, in the pulmonary parenchyma. Uh, dogs and cats in left-sided failure can also have pleural effusion. And if you guys are not confident about the difference between an interstitial versus an alveolar pattern or how to recognize a pleural effusion, um, then I'd recommend uh, watching uh, the webinar we produced on lung patterns, where we talk a little bit more about those things. Patients that have right-sided heart failure essentially have increased systemic venous pressure. Um, because of that, um, you are going to get uh, effusion, um, both in the thoracic cavity and in the abdominal cavity. So we're going to get pleural effusion and the cites, and these dogs also have big livers, um, so they have hepatomegaly. So just before we finish, let's just take a look at a patient that uh, is in heart failure. So we have a lateral and a dorsoventral radiograph um, of a dog. Uh, the heart um, is enlarged, so uh, it's occupying um, a large proportion of the thoracic cavity in both the lateral uh, and in the dorsoventral view. Uh, the shape of the cardiac silhouette is abnormal in the lateral view. We can see that there is a quite marked steepening of the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette just here. And then we've got dorsal displacement um, of the trachea. Um, the pulmonary vessels actually look reasonably normal in the lateral view, and they're quite tricky to see in the dorsal ventral view. And the reason for that is because there's an increase in opacity in the right middle and the right caudal lung lobes. So there's an interstitial pattern in the right middle and right caudal lung lobes. And we can see that uh, more easily in the DV view. In the lateral view, if we compare the opacity of the craniaventral lung to the dorsocaudal lung, then the dorsocaudal lung is definitely increased in opacity relative to the craniaventral lung. So we've got cardiomegaly, we've got uh, left atrial enlargement. Um, if we look uh, at the DV view, um, the the cowboy here looks like he's sat on his horse reasonably comfortably, so it doesn't look particularly bow-legged. So that angle of bronchial divergence doesn't look like it's particularly increased. We don't have the double wall sign either, um, but certainly in the lateral view, there's convincing evidence of left atrial enlargement. And we've also got this interstitial pattern in the dorsocaudal thorax and in the right middle and right caudal lung lobe. And not only that, but we've got a low bar sign here as well. So between the right cranial and the right middle lung lobe, and we've got uh, this little uh, either fissure or low bar sign. So there could be a really small volume pleural effusion here, um, or this low bar sign could be as a result of an a difference in density between the normal right cranial lung lobe and then this right middle lung lobe that is full of infiltrate. So this patient uh, essentially has a big left atrium um, and it has evidence of uh, edema um, affecting the right middle and the right caudal lung lobes. Um, so this is a patient that has uh, left sided disease, uh, mitral valve disease, a big left atrium, and is just thinking about, um, well, actually is in heart failure. Uh, so yeah, um, that's uh, an example of a patient with cardiac disease and heart failure. And that about wraps it up for now. So uh, hopefully you guys um, enjoyed uh, that webinar. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, don't be shy. Um, pop me an email um, or drop me a line. Uh, everyone um, stay safe and stay well. And hopefully I'll catch up with you again a little way down the line.
thanks very much for listening. Bye-bye.